Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have another devotion. This time we're in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 13, focusing on verse 16. So in this opening week of the Sacred Conversation series, I've wanted to just zoom in on you, the evangelist. I'm assuming that you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian yet, go back and, and uh, watch our watch devotion number uh, 589 <laughs> and then come back to this one. Uh, I've focused on you and your heart as an evangelist, as a Christian, being filled with the Spirit. By the Spirit, you know that you're saved. That same Holy Spirit will indwell in the hearts of those whom you lead to Christ as well. It's how we know we remain in Him. He has given us of His Spirit. We saw that in yesterday's devotion in, in uh, 1 John 4, 13. Galatians 5 has more to say about this, about knowing that the Holy Spirit of God is within us. The sacred conversations begin by the prompting of the Spirit. How do I come to recognize the Holy Spirit's voice? How do I know that that prompting is from God and not from something else, just making it up in my own head? Or how do I know I'm not even being tempted away by evil to do something stupid and embarrass myself, you know, or even somehow suffer uh, 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 professional consequences at my place of work or social consequences in my online presence or among my circle of friends because now I've outed myself as one of those Jesus people. And, and now l look at what's happened here. The Holy Spirit will tell you to bring up the gospel. God will determine the results. It is an act of faith to do so and let we free Americans not be found ashamed in the heavenly company of those who proclaimed Christ to the very peril of their lives. Galatians chapter five, I'm gonna begin in verse 13 to get a running start. He's speaking about how we, we don't, we, we've been delivered from sin, so we don't wanna put on the yoke of sin again, All right? Don't go back into slavery, you've been set free from sin. He's dealing a lot in Galatians 5 because this issue came up in the church in Acts chapter 15 where the Judaizers, the mutilators of the flesh, as Paul calls them in Galatians, were insisting that you also have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Acts chapter 15 is where the, it, the issue kind of first came up in, the, uh, uh, in terms of the timeline. It's that early on. Uh, and Peter spoke up against the, the, the circumcision party, the Judaizers, uh, saying, like, you're putting a burden on us that neither we nor our forefathers were able to bear. That this is not, <laughs> this was, this was never, this is never a burden that we were to bear. You're trying to tell these grown men who just gave their lives for Christ they have to undergo circumcision. Uh, uh, so he uses, uh, Paul is, is genuinely furious about this when he's writing Galatians under the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit. And that comes out. This is the most, it's the most confrontational tone that he takes, even more confrontational than uh, what we saw in First and Second Corinthians, especially First Corinthians. So here's 5.13, Galatians 5.13. You were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you remember Matthew 22? But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. I say then, here's what I want us to zoom in on because it's relevant especially to the context of sacred conversations and evangelism. I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. They are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, uh-oh, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, uh-oh, carousing, that means being hungover all the time, not at your best, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? We saw this in 1 Corinthians 6. He lists out examples that were present throughout the region of Galatia, uh, 
Corinthians was written to like a singular city, so the examples are very specific there. These are more broad because the, the, the original recipients covered literally a more broad geographical area. But he, he doesn't just name these specifically. He starts with like idolatry, you know, like that's broad idol worship across the board. Uh, you know, he, he's talking about how these are the acts of the flesh, the works of the flesh. And he uses those in contrast with the fruit of the spirit, right? So the works of the flesh are obvious. That's verse 19, sexual morality, moral impurity, promiscuity. He's naming just in broad terms what happens when we just do what the flesh wants versus what the spirit wants. Because we see, like he said, that the flesh and the spirit are opposed to each other. That's verse 17, Galatians 5, 17. So when we're doing what the flesh wants, that's what results from it, immorally, immorality of all sorts. He even uses the broad kind of catch-all term, uh, you know, and, and, and anything similar in verse 21, anything similar to any of this. So if you, I went through that whole catalog of sins, you're like, never done that, never done that, never done that, never done that, guess what? <laughs> like, you've done something like that, all right? Anything similar to that. We've all given in at some point to the desires of the flesh. And then he contrasts it with the fruit of the Spirit. I think that's quite beautiful. The fruit, the result, the outcome. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Okay, that comes from earlier on, where now, because we're walking by the Spirit, because we, those of us who are led by the Spirit are not under the law. That's verse 18. And there's no law against love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. The law is not against such things. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. So in verse 25, he re reiterates something that came up earlier in this text. All right, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This echoes verse 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit. You see the, the theme that began and then closed this teaching? Walking by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. Aha, it's parallel structure. And you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. So when we keep in step with the Spirit, we do so one step at a time. You know, the metaphor is not the metaphor is not too ethereal to grasp. One step at a time, one act of love at a time, right? That, uh, that we will exhibit peace and joy. That's a good thing, right? Another biblical way to substantiate that, yes, it is true that the, the Holy Spirit's presence is going to be accompanied by emotion. One emotion that's listed here is joy, but the others are not emotions. Right? Peace can be an emotion, I guess, but I think it goes beyond just feeling peaceful. It's also patience, which is not an emotion, but an attitude and a behavior. Kindness, which is actions, along with words. Goodness, it's our character. Our character is transformed. Faithfulness, that can only be proven over a long period of time. Gentleness and self-control. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a couple, I think three now, these little books for LifeWay students on this. Uh, Be Kind was one. Uh, the Way Out was another. Right? That was First Corinthians. I think I talked about self-control as well um, as another. And then there was one on the Trinity. But this teaching has bearing on our evangelistic walk. If we're going to have the sacred conversation. We're going to bring up Jesus. We're going to take that step prompted by the Holy Spirit. We've got to make sure that we're not a bunch of stupid flaming hypocrites. Man, what keeps me from bringing up the gospel at times is usually just my own stupid sin. You know, oh man, I like, who am I to talk to somebody about Jesus? You know, I believe me, preachers understand this better than you might think we do. <laughs> like, you think that we can't relate? to the pressure of struggling with your own sin personally and repenting when you mess up, but then getting up and talking to other people about Jesus? Yeah, that's a weekly 
that's a weekly battle for the pastor. The pastor doesn't, he, he wasn't born without a sin nature. He's born with exactly what Galatians 5 describes. He's got flesh too, and he's got the spirit, and these two are opposed to one another. Don't let your sin be what stops somebody else from hearing the gospel. How grotesquely unfair is that? Keep in step with the spirit. The mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the, of the flesh is death. It is the flesh that would cause you to be apprehensive about obeying the Great Commission and bringing up the gospel. If you're going to lead people to Jesus, start with a good self-inventory and be brutally honest with yourself. We can all be champions at kind of polishing up our own sin or downplaying our sin's severity. Man, I've done that before. It didn't work out well, right? Like, don't downplay how bad your sin is. Don't, don't go too far on the other end of the spectrum and self-flagellate and, and over-exacerbate things and, and, you know, bring upon yourself consequences that God never imposed upon you. That's what the Opus Dei cult does, right? They like wear these things around their legs that dig into their flesh so that they feel suffering because of their sin at all time. God never prescribed that. That never crossed his mind. Rather, look at your sin for what it is, right? Understand it. You can tell when you're walking according to the flesh because these things catalog in verses 19 to 21, they result from it. And you can tell when you're keeping in step with the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit, described in verses 22 through 26, those, those results just flow from your life. So knowing, anticipating, preparing for the sacred conversation, it helps to not feel like a stupid hypocrite when the gospel comes up. Don't use your sin as a rationale for not obeying the Great Commission. Rather, use the Great Commission as extra motivation to repent from your stupid sin, okay? Bust open the closet door and yank everything out, okay? Get drastic with it. It's like an episode of Hoarders, time to bring in a bobcat, little mini bulldozer, okay? Get it all out. See what I mean? Don't, don't let a fear of feeling like a hypocrite when you bring up the gospel stop you from obeying Jesus at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Don't let your friend go to hell because you struggled with sin. How stupid is that? Instead, let your motivation to share your faith with your friend get the sin out of your life. That's a much better testimony. So review Galatians 5. Okay, see the war between the spirits and dwelling and the fleshly nature. And don't just choose to let the flesh keep you from ever having sacred conversations. What a terrible, terrible waste. I cannot imagine standing before God and saying that. Like, so you, you struggle with sin, and then because of your sin, you didn't evangelize. Why didn't you just repent from sin and evangelize? <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make any sense, does it? But this is one of the number one things that Christians bring up when it comes up to not bringing up their faith. Like, I don't want to feel like a hypocrite. So just don't be a hypocrite. Repent. Repent, 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 repent again and repent. And then by all means, keep in step with the Spirit of God.